Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be here, and I want to thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it's an honor to sit here with the family of Delilah Pierce. Uh, I am just, it's an honor. Uh, I am even equally moved at this moment at the presence of my two sororers, <laughs> Gloria Freeman and Gloria Green. Gloria Green, as she has mentioned, was the president of Edify Sigma. I want to talk a little bit this afternoon in my brief comments to you all at this lovely uh, hosted team. Um, I want to thank you. I want to talk a little bit about a different perspective that I bring. Um, first of all, I want to clearly state that I did not personally know in a personal way Delilah Pierce, but I want to talk about her uh, from the idea of communities of affiliation. I currently teach research at uh, the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C. And my job there is to prepare students to write their thesis. At the same time, I'm also a member of the subcommittee that is handling the educational programming for the current exhibition, 30 Americans. And I personally have headed up a project uh, called uh, InterVision Symposium. And the title of my talk today is taken from our Earth, Wind, and Fire old album. Uh, one of the songs that I always loved on that album was called Open Our Eyes. Oh, yeah. And I always loved the 70s because no matter what a artist sang about, they also had, they always had that one spiritual song on the album. And I would play the albums over and over again. And as I look at the curated uh, exhibition catalogs that are done by Trevor Schumacher, uh, and others, um, I'm always moved by their talking about the artists and their connection to the music of the 70s. That was a time that we got through. We were the first line after the uh, uh, civil rights acquisitions legislatively, and I think that uh, it should not go unnoticed on us. So I want to talk about Delilah Pierce and a series of questions that I have in the context of education. And one of the things that I, as a 30-year educator, am charged with uh, helping other students to formulate research is that what things were present in the uh, art education practices of Delilah Pierce and her contemporaries that have influenced the forming of groups like Edify Sigma and others that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, what were the departure points from the quote-unquote training that they had as art educators uh, that made their approaches inspiring uh, and inspired us as a generation to create these groups in Washington? Uh, what critical relationships within Washington and Baltimore between educators who were in the public schools, higher education, museums, and art collectors served to inform and encourage the attributes of civil rights and social justice. Currently, uh, at the <coughs> Corcoran, we have a series of visiting artists. Uh, you are looking at, on the far right, Nina uh, Chanel Abney, who was a visiting artist who came recently and worked with uh, children in the school. It's always interesting to me that when these artists come, they come in the context of artists, educators, and she was one among this group of 30 American artists who were willing. And it's my contention that folks like Delilah Pierce and Lois Maylou Jones were really inspiring to uh, continue in a particular way towards art education. I think that we had a very interesting talk, Mertice, at Howard University early this fall, and we were trying to define art education. And we came to the conclusion that art education within the black community seems to take on a different nuance. It happened anyway, whether we were segregated outside of uh, showing the images. We had a uh, our own agenda, which we have tended to put forward 
in spite of our omission from art education curriculum. You know, Washington's unique status as a federal city has played out in some often tumultuous struggles over governance of the public schools in Washington. You know, Congress actually created the public school system in 1804, two years after the District of Columbia had established as a municipal government. Nearly six decades later, the city opened public schools for African-American children that were separate for, for the, from the system for whites. The school has long reflected changes in the city and the nation. The system has operated under various school boards, but all, always it should be noted that the system uh, was under congressional oversight. But with the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance, it really encouraged an emergence of a different kind of feeling for our own self-determination. Art education began for black students in southern schools when black colleges included art as an integral part of the curriculum. Art education in black colleges did not begin, actually I was surprised to learn this, until 1921. Prior to this, there were few blacks that were engaged in the art of teaching. Black colleges existed prior to this time, did not really have fine arts departments. In Donald Fred Davies' uh, dissertation critique of the presence of African American art educators in the documented histories of education and art education, there is no mention of them in major art education textbooks. For instance, the history of art education in the public schools in the United States and the introduction of art as a general education subject in American schools, we are virtually not mentioned in any of those. This prompted a series of research questions related to Delilah and her contemporaries. What blueprints did community leaders such as Delilah Pierce give to current and future generations regarding civic commitment, legacy and stewardship, trust of our children through the arts, what important and significant practices occurred uh, in Washington with Washington-based artists, art educators, that inform our current industry practices? So right now in our country, only 9% of the 6.5 million teachers that teach are black, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, although the percentage is slightly higher in Pittsburgh, where blacks make up roughly 15% of schools. We know that uh, NCLB has made a tremendous difference in the amount of teachers that we have currently in the school system. According to Michelle Foster, author of Black Teachers on Teaching, in 1974, the majority of teachers were prepared by HBCUs. Ten years later, they're graduating only half that number at the time that she wrote her uh, essay, Black Teachers on Teaching. She asserts that testing has had a tremendous impact. When we think about Delilah Pierce, we know that she had a career that spanned her teaching at Shaw Junior High School. And it is interesting to note that both she and Alma Thomas taught there. She also taught at Banneker Junior High School. And uh, as a matter of fact, McDill was her student there. Her niece yes. was her <laughs> student there. <laughs> <laughs> she also taught at Cordoza High School in Northwest Washington, as well as the University of District of Columbia. My research, one account says that she taught in the Fine Arts Department, but she actually uh, taught as, uh, in the art education program. According to the 1993 catalog from the exhibition catalog in uh, OSU, the Lila Pierce studied at Modest Teacher College and Howard University. And we've already uh, talked about where she had studied, but after she, her illustrious teaching career, she retired to the District of Columbia Teachers College, now UDC, an assistant professor of art. The Barnett Aiden catalog lists her as retiring as an assistant professor. Uh, in art education. So what has happened within the black colleges to our art education programs? We really need to pause and think about that because they really were the anchors for what we wanted to do and how we went forward. 
So we talked about the teaching awards, but uh, Delilah also received a teaching fellowship and was a member of Phi Delta Kappa. She received an achievement award for outstanding service in art and art education. And many of you may not know this, but there is actually there was actually a Delilah Pierce Day on April the 12th, 1980, by proclamation of Ma uh, Mayor Marion Barry of Washington, D.C. The Women's Caucus for Art gave her a Lifetime Achievement Award in New York in 1991. And the Barnett Aiden catalog, they highlight that Pierce's travels throughout Africa and the United States are reflected in her paintings that cover a wide geographic breadth, from the sun-baked shores of the Sudan in Africa to the froggy tranquility of New England shores, especially they mention Oak Bluff, Massachusetts, where Pierce made her home when she was not in Washington. Many of you know that Delilah was a close friend of Alma Thomas. Alma Thomas was a colorist, and she had gained recognition as a professional artist in 1960 after retiring from teaching in the Washington, D.C. public schools. She had been a student at American University under Jacob Kanan and Joe Summerfield, who emphasized color field painting and color. Originally representational, uh, Alma, transi Alma transitioned into an abstract painter. In the 12 years since then, she was creating color field paintings similar to those of the New York School. Thomas was the first graduate of the Howard University Art Department. In 1972, she was the first African-American woman to have a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Another solo exhibition at the Whitney uh, Museum of American Art. Another exhibition took place at the Corcoran. So again, I asked the question about communities of affiliation. We talk in art education at this moment in time and in uh, encouraging research about this idea of inter-influences. Uh, it may be little recognized that Delilah was a writer who co-authored and published by the Smithsonian Museum part of this catalog. She actually writes within this catalog. And many of the things that we don't appreciate in contemporary art is that people like Carrie James Marshall, they are writing and they are intellectual and they are offering ideas that art education would greatly um, be influenced by. So I just wanted to make sure that you all knew about those. And in my, uh, I want to go back and point out that Corinne Mitchell was an important person that we need to talk about uh, in relationship to Delilah Pierce. If it had not been for Corinne Mitchell, I would not have known about Delilah Pierce. When you see that group photograph, it was because of the commitment of this woman, Corinne yeah. Mitchell, who had been a school teacher yes. in Montgomery County Public Schools. She was yeah. the first African American uh, uh, public school teacher. Now, if you remember in the state of Maryland, we actually had to sue for equal pay in the state of Maryland. Black teachers had to sue to receive equal pay. Corinne was courageous in her vision. She took two groups. I think she started Theta, and then two years later began Eta Phi Sigma. And she, her vision was to bring these established professional artists like Delilah Pierce, like Lois Maylou Jones, like uh, uh, Evelyn Ware, and bring us together with teachers who were currently teaching. So there was this energy, this yes, juice yes, at Howard yes. University to UDC that we don't have possession. There are not art departments in art education departments currently in these institutions. And we must begin to ask the question, why? Why? In the last 48 hours, I have been um, just enthralled because a year ago I had a vision inspired by Corinne inspired by Delilah Pierce and these group of women because they were brave and they were doing brave things in ways that countered what was asked of us within the education agenda. A year ago, I had a vision that uh, teachers of color would write for a national publication called the Art Education Journal. 
and they would talk about culturally responsive teaching because it's time to name it, it's time to say it, and it's time to call for it. If they were courageous enough to go from, can you imagine after a, a career in public education, to take that second breath and say, now I'm gonna go train the teachers. <laughs> so there is something wonderful in that that we have to appreciate. So when I think about Corinne, and I think about these women, and I think about being in my graduate year, um, I thought culturally responsive teaching is going to be a special issue that I went to the Art Education Association and I said, it's time. You're writing about us, but we need to write about ourselves. It's time. And so in my little knapsack I'm proudly carrying around, I only needed six. I've got 14 articles that have been submitted from across the country because we realized that the lunch counter now is ideological. <coughs> it's no longer that physicality, that hard lunch counter, but it is one of spirit that was modeled. Had we not known and been a part of a group like this that showed us how courageous they were, then I would not have the vision. I wouldn't have had the vision under Mary Jackson, Gloria Green, Gloria Freeman, who always were out there modeling Rachel Davis, <laughs> all of them. Rachel Davis used to have uh, shows in her backyard. Uh, for them to take that, E.J. Montgomery, I mean, just loving people who were brave enough. Elizabeth Catlin, I mean, uh, when I think about Samella Lewis, you know, these were people who were writing our history accounts and making it available. They were the first books. So uh, here you see the Washington right. Post <laughs> actually did a story on our group. And uh, this was in the Washington Post, I believe about 1990, that did a story on the relationship between these two sororities. So within uh, <laughs> Gloria Freeman, raise your hand. We published a book in which Delilah was featured as well as Gloria Freeman, uh, Mary Jackson, and so Jenny, uh, what was her last name that wrote the poetry? Howard. Jenny Howard wrote poems in response to things that we were painting. So Lois Mabel Jones was a part of that book. Peggy Valentine, another great Montgomery County public school teacher. And here's Delilah's piece. So it was really remarkable to have you show Nebula because here is yet another piece <laughs> from that series. <laughs> and I just had to do that because I wanted you to see close up the beauty yeah. of that particular piece. It's quite a wonderful piece. <laughs> so we must remember this line. We have the intellectual line. We must continue to support uh, initiatives, intellectual initiatives, but this has to get into the school for our children. This has, when we look at the Porta Colloquium, when we look at the Intervision Symposium, which I'm gonna pass around, I have just a couple of copies, but I'd love for you all to come and be a part of that. We have to remember that that information needs to get to our schools. When we think about the contemporary African-American artists, uh, even the ones that have passed on like Vesquet. When we think about our intellectual treasures like the Schomburg Center in New York, when we think about uh, young contemporary African-American artists like Megalene Thomas, when we think about Nick Cave and his sound suits, when we think about Glenn Lagon, who is one of the first African-Americans to have a piece in the White House. Can you think about that and the idea that our children aren't even really abreast of the idea of collecting. They can be collectors, they can be stakeholders, but we need to make sure that that information is getting to them. So thank you for letting me give my few comments here. And um, thank you.